I can see the Zoom room is filling up. Welcome to Football Letter Live. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. Want to let everybody have the opportunity to get into the Zoom room. We have a great show planned for you this evening. Sandy Barber is joining us with uh, some really good news about Penn State football. John Black will be with us as always, and we're going to feature our Lion Ambassadors and the impact that they have on the experience in Beaver Stadium. We're all familiar with the S-Zone. We're going to take you behind the scenes to see how the S-Zone comes together. If you are joining us in Zoom, go ahead and open up your chat box and let us know who you are and where you're from and your Penn State class here. If you want to ask a question, you could drop that in the Q&A tab there on the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will be getting started in just a couple minutes. Welcome to Football Letter Live. Once again, a lot of great representation from our chapters tonight. I see uh, Kevin Lashane from the Aiken Augusta chapter, uh, Patty Wenrick from Belfont. I see uh, Amy and Tom Guzzo, they're class of 82. They may be on to support one of our guests coming up a little bit later in the program. I see JJ Myers down there in Rolla, Missouri. Dave Seitzinger, Russ from Syracuse. Uh, shout out to my dad, Joe Clifford, class of 72, tuning in. What's up, dad? Tanya in Springfield, class of 87. Welcome to Football Letter Live. We will be getting started in just a minute or two. Ed and Pat Nicolano from Sea Isle, New Jersey. Scott and Terry Purnell, Ellicott City represented here. All right, welcome in everybody. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association and welcome to Football Letter Live. For more than 80 years, the Penn State Alumni Association has covered the football team with its one of a kind perspective through the football letter. Now this historic publication begins a new era with the launching of Football Letter Live and we will be having this virtual show throughout the next few months and it'll be airing eight o'clock every Thursday night. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window and then click show subtitles so you can take advantage of the live closed captions. We are recording this session and we'll share it across our social media channels afterward. Tonight I'm joined by the legendary football Editor of the Football Letter, John Black from the Class of 62. Good evening, John. How are you? I'm fine, Paul. It's great to be here again. We're also going to talk to Sandy Barber. Sandy Barber is here in our virtual studio, the Vice President of Intercollegiate Athletics. So it'll be good to talk to Sandy about the good news that she has to report this week. We're also going to highlight the student experience at Penn State. And we're going to be speaking with John Neese, uh, teaching professor and associate head of the undergraduate programs in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Sciences here at Penn State. We are encouraging, encouraging you to share questions, so go ahead and drop them in the Q&A box. And let's go ahead and get started and welcome the Vice President for Intercollegiate Athletics onto Football Letter Live. Sandy Barber, how are you this evening? 
I'm doing great, Paul, and it's great to be with you all. And it's uh, great to be with uh, with all of our passionate alumni and and fans and and others. Uh, and it and it has been a good week. Uh, we finally got some uh, some really positive news, and uh, I think we're all fired up about it. Absolutely. And and look, you were kind of leading that effort, that return to competition task force with the Big Ten. You were a co-chair of that. Can you talk a little bit about your role with that task force? Sure. It was, uh, I'll tell you what, it was an honor uh, to, to serve with, uh, uh, with the head team physician uh, at, uh, at Ohio State, a gentleman by the name of Jim Borchers, Dr. Jim Borchers. And, uh, and then we had a committee, pretty large committee of, uh, of about 20 uh, 20 people, uh, mostly uh, medical, uh, medical experts, uh, folks with medical expertise, whether it be in infectious disease or mental health or uh, trainers or, or head team physicians. Uh, we had a cardiologist, uh, Dr. Larry Rink uh, from Indiana. Um, I learned a ton. I can uh, speak a little bit of the, the medical lang language now, uh, but I, I did co-chair it with, uh, with Jim uh, we had four other athletic directors on the committee. Uh, we were there really just to, to lend uh, practical application, uh, whether it be from a governance standpoint or it be how, how something, a, a protocol might work or where the problems are. Uh, so we were, uh, we really just carried the bags for the, uh, for the medical experts. Uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was a lot of work. Um, we, we really started, uh, I, I wouldn't tell you we started on August 11th, uh, but maybe 5 a.m. August 12th, uh, because we, we felt strongly uh, that although we certainly respected uh, the president's and the chancellor's concern around health and safety and, uh, and the testing protocols and the, the cardiac protocols, et cetera, we felt there was an answer. Um, and uh, so we worked tirelessly. Uh, we worked over the course of those next five weeks. Uh, and Time helped us uh, over that period of time. Uh, the testing landscape changed dramatically, uh, and that was a huge help. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a dynamic situation that, that we are in. And so even though a decision was made in early August, right, that's actually when the work started to, to begin because the, the decision was made not to play. And so then everybody went to work to determine, okay, well then what is it gonna to take to get us to be able to play? And so what were some of the things that your, your committee took a look at and, and what were kind of the, the factors in making the decision that it's time to play on August 24th? Well, the great thing was that, uh, that if you look closely at the, at the press release uh, from August 11th, uh, the presidents and chancellors said they were postponing and, uh, and that they were gonna look at uh, and examine a number, a number of options so we went to work on figuring out, all right, ex exactly what are the concerns? Uh, and then we went out and gathered the experts uh, so that we could come up with a protocol for, uh, for cardiac uh, return, for the cardiac concerns around myocarditis and, and maybe long-term impacts on the, the hearts of even, even young uh, student athletes, uh, you know, the population that we're dealing with here. So it was that, it was uh, around uh, the, the testing protocols and, and was once a week or twice a week the right thing. Um, and again, there's so many things I've learned about whether it's PCR tests or it's antigen tests or it's uh, point of care, uh, you, you name it. Um, I, I hope we have some doctors uh, in the audience that are gonna poke holes in this for me. Um, but uh, I learned, learned a ton. And, uh, and, and along with our experts that we were able to, and it's amazing, uh, it's amazing the, the expertise that we have access to at Penn State, uh, through Penn State Hershey and through our faculty members uh, on our campus here at University Park. Uh, but also then when you cast that net wide across all 14 of our institutions, I think this is really an example of the power of that, the power of the Big Ten and the expertise that resides in our 11 states and in our 14 institutions. And uh, so that's really what we spent five weeks uh, doing. We went to a subset of the presidents and chancellors uh, a couple of times in the process just to get their feedback, make sure that we were kind of on point uh, as it related to addressing their, their concerns and the things that they were uncertain about. Um, and then by the time we went to them for the last time on Sunday, uh, they were kind of blown away by, uh, by the presentation and about how buttoned up it was uh, and, uh, and the way in which it, it answered their questions. Uh, 
Sandy, is there any truth to the rumor that uh, you uh, received an honorary doctor of medicine degree in this whole process uh, over the last five weeks? Well, no, <laughs> far, far from it. But uh, as I said, I, I, did, uh, I did learn a, a, an, an immense amount. Um, I've got uh, three doctors in my, in my next level down uh, in my family, and, and they're all laughing at the fact that I, you know, I co-chaired the medical committee. Uh, little do they know that, uh, that my expertise that I brought to them was not, uh, was not from a medical standpoint. <laughs> right. But there are some uh, restrictions and standards that uh, still have to be met as this process uh, continues uh, throughout the uh, planned season. Is that correct? Oh, Absolutely. And, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up because what the, the protocols that we've been put in place um, are as strict as any as you will find in, in college athletics right now. Now, I don't believe that they're overly strict. I don't believe that they will uh, prevent us uh, from, from playing uh, the, through the course of the season. Uh, but in terms of, uh, let's say, our, our cardiac protocols, uh, those, are, those are absolutely, there's no other conference. Uh, that has uh, has put those in place, and frankly, I feel really good about that. Uh, it's uh, for the safety and uh, health and safety and protection of our student athletes, and I, I think that's the, the way it ought to be. Um, from a testing standpoint, uh, many of you, I'm sure, have uh, have read about the uh, test positivity rates uh, and the population positivity rate. So those are each around the team, the team population. In this case, obviously, we're talking about uh, the football team. Uh, also remember those are, or note, that those are seven day moving averages. So it's not, a, a lot of people have remarked to me, well, shoot, 5% on a football team of 120 is, is uh, you know, is six students. Well, that would have to be six student athletes every day for seven days um, uh, to, to come up with a 5% with a average over seven days. So between that and the, the population uh, positivity rate, uh, our experts, again, felt that those were very good indicators. Um, are, are they a little conservative? Probably, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not overly onerous. And uh, we keep in mind what our, our community uh, and, and locale uh, uh, positivity rate is as well, because that's, that's really important uh, for the safety and health of not only the student athletes and the coaches and the staff, uh, but also of our community. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's important to us as well. So Sandy, let me, uh, I know we have you for a limited amount of time here this evening. Let me ask you a couple quick hitters. Okay, now we've announced we're playing football. When do we see a schedule? <laughs> well, <laughs> we, went, we went to work on that. Uh, well, it's been, it's been underway, uh, but we spent about two and a half hours this morning as an athletic directors group. Uh, there, there was a separate scheduling committee uh, that, uh, that really looked at the shell of the schedule. Now we've got to get down to the real, the real specifics. We've got to work with our television partners uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have their input uh, into them because they're important, uh, very important partners for us. I, I, would, uh, I would say the end of the week, since tomorrow's the end of the week, is, uh, is a little aggressive, uh, but I, I, it, it ought to be early next week uh, that, that we should have it. So the announcement encompassed football, uh, but we have fans on here of our volleyball team and of our soccer teams. Uh, when can we see, expect to see them back in action? Yeah, so uh, we were asked as a, as a medical uh, task force, a medical uh, committee, uh, to look at football first. Because uh, first of all, it's the largest. Um, and therefore, anything we did there, we knew we could scale down. Uh, and, uh, and so we were charged with looking only, only at football. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, but now that we have that building block, uh, we think it should be relatively easy to piece the others together. Now the challenges, uh, or actually the challenging thing around our fall sports is, our other fall sports other than football, is that the NCAA has moved their championship, their NCAA championship, has moved it to the spring. Uh, so what we have to, what we had been planning on doing is playing those sports in the spring, uh, connected to that spring, to that championship in the spring. Uh, but now that we have the opportunity to play, we know the ACC, the SEC, and the Big 12 are playing some contests in those sports. Uh, and so we have to look at uh, and make sure uh, whatever gives our, our programs the best chance to compete for a national championship, because all of those, all of our fall sports uh, are, are, um, you know, our real our impactors uh, in the national championship hunt. We want to make sure that that continues. 
I know this is all like a step-by-step -step process, right? It's let's put together a plan to make sure that the student athletes have the safest possible um, environment to compete in. Uh, but we know that there's an awful lot that goes on around um, the sporting events and around a football game. So questions are coming in around uh, the cheer and spirit squads, uh, blue band. Who's going to be able to uh, be able to participate uh, and, and experience Penn State football in Beaver Stadium this year? So, Paul, we really don't have as solid answers to, to those kinds of things uh, right this minute. Um, as you as you mentioned, it was uh, our, our major focus was can we play football? Can we provide those young men with the opportunity to play the sport uh, that they love? We do have um, operations folks across the Big Ten uh, who have been working on kind of event uh, protocols. Uh, and we think now that we have an opportunity to go back and, and play, uh, that they'll button up their, their work. And th they, those will contain recommendations about who else uh, can be a part of, uh, a part of the, the event. Now, one of the challenges we have at Penn State uh, is that right now, uh, Governor Wolf's orders uh, say 250 uh, people at an outdoor event. Well, we're, we're going to be hard pressed to uh, have the two teams, uh, the officials, uh, the chain gang, uh, the people running cameras and some other things and not exceed 250 right there. So uh, we'll be, uh, we'll certainly be talking to, uh, to the governor's office uh, uh, here pretty shortly uh, as we've got everything in line uh, and figuring out how we might do that. The other thing we, of course, want to do is be able to accommodate the families of both the visiting and, and home team um, and the families of, of the coaches and the staff. Uh, but we won't be able to do that without uh, some kind of relief in the governor's orders. So again, I know we have limited time, so I'm going to limit to one more question. We could ask uh, a lot of questions. We could talk about this all night. Uh, we're all very much interested in cheering on the Nittany Lions when they get back on the field on uh, the end of October, but I want to switch gears a little bit and, and ask you about your work on the anti-hate and anti-racism coalition. Uh, as, as, as the pandemic of COVID-19 has swept the country, the pandemic of uh, social injustice that continues to go on throughout the country um, has also come to light during, during this period. And I know you've taken, uh, uh, you've taken a pretty active role within the Big Ten on that coalition. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Paul, it's, it's really been tremendous. I mean, obviously, uh, to have uh, social injustice uh, come to light in, in the ways, or, or have, I shouldn't say come to light, we, we've known it was there uh, forever. Um, but uh, to have the light shined on it uh, in the way that it has been in, uh, uh, dur during a pandemic has been really challenging. Uh, and uh, I, I give uh, the Big Ten and I give Commissioner Warren uh, a lot of credit. Uh, this was uh, uh, this was a um, a pillar uh, that he talked about uh, immediately upon arriving uh, at the uh, at the conference office and, and assuming his leadership role um, and it obviously was was thrust uh, to the head of the line um, particularly with uh, with George Floyd's uh, murder and uh, it's just been an opportunity for. Um, so many student athletes, there are at least uh, two or three or four student athletes from each of the 14 institutions, uh, a number of the athletic directors, uh, a number of coaches, uh, a couple of faculty reps, our, our faculty athletics representative, uh, Dennis Scanlon, uh, is, on, uh, is on the commission. Um, and it's, uh, it's really, like a lot of us, it's been, um, it's, it's been an opportunity to have conversations. It's been an opportunity to uh, to have uh, to, to hear hear people's story um, and to you know as as a as a white woman um, I, I certainly can't talk about uh, what it's like for uh, for Black Americans and uh, and so that I, I think has been really good for for all of us. We've had an opportunity to bring those things back to our campus. I'm really proud of the work that our student athletes uh, are doing uh, around educating themselves. Uh, around educating others, uh, around furthering the cause, around standing up 
and using their voices uh, for uh, for social justice, uh, and, uh, and and they will continue to, and it will be a priority for us in the department uh, just to give them an opportunity to use their use their voices. Certainly not going to tell them what to say or or, or what to do, uh, but uh, I, I've always been an advocate for in those ages of you know 18 to 22 on these fabulous campuses. Um, and particularly ours, uh, of, of student athletes uh, standing up, uh, speaking, uh, speaking their truth, what, whatever that is, uh, and, uh, and, and learning, uh, and, and then going out and, and helping to promote uh, for, you know, a better world. Absolutely. Well, Sandy, you know, you, it, it's really easy to lead through the good times, right? But it's, I know it's difficult to lead through these tough times, and you continue to lead um, through whatever obstacles are put in front of us with Penn State Athletics. I know you also contribute uh, across the university in your leadership role as, as the Vice President for Intercollegiate Athletics. And uh, on behalf of uh, our team at the Penn State Alumni Association, I'm truly grateful for all that you do for Penn State and for our student athletes and for our alumni. So thank you very much for joining us on Football Letter Live. Well, thanks, Paul. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I sure miss being, uh, being with our alumni and being with our passionate fans. It's, it's something really special. Um, I believe in Penn State. Uh, I believe in, uh, in our student athletes. And, and I wanted to work hard to bring football back um, not only to our student athletes and those guys and let them play the game they love, but I know how important it is to, uh, to our alumni uh, just to, to have something to feel good about. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, you know, our, our program's pretty good uh, right now. And I think they're going to give us a lot to, to smile about at a, really, at a really difficult and challenging time uh, for, uh, for our nation. And I know for families and individuals everywhere. Absolutely. Sandy, I Thank appreciate you. you. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right. John Black, we're going to turn our attention to the Lion Ambassadors. Yes, uh, and I, I want to throw out a question to you, John. You were a staff member at the Penn State Alumni Association when the Lion Ambassadors were founded. Take us back to those days and those conversations that were going on on campus about how to engage students with the Penn State Alumni Association. Uh, yes, indeed, Paul. I was fortunate to be designated as a staff member to work with a student group and bringing to, to uh, fruition uh, the, what turned out eventually to be the Lion Ambassadors, looking for a way in which the Alumni Association could sponsor a group of students that would represent the university uh, externally and among alumni as well as on campus, uh, spearheading uh, the spirit and in inculcating uh, new students with Penn State spirit and informing them of the traditions and uh, everything from uh, welcoming new freshmen at Be Apart from the start to sending off the seniors at the senior send off and making them realize what a uh, role they can play as active alumni for the rest of their lives. So in 1982, we put together a uh, cadre of uh, very interested uh, student leaders that uh, were dedicated to this idea, and we're going to have one of them on here uh, in just a moment, uh, uh, Lori Johnson, who was one of that crew, and uh, it was a pleasure to get them uh, rolling uh, within about a six-month period, and by uh, the spring semester of 1982, we had an active organization that uh, initiated a class of at least 40 members, and it has grown since then. But these are kids that take a leading role on campus. Uh, everything from uh, offering tours to prospective students on campus and their parents to, uh, as I say, uh, informing students about uh, Penn State history and tradition and inculcating them and to being uh, active students and alumni for the rest of their lives. Well, we have some of those folks joining us today. Uh, you know, it's amazing what started off as an idea in 1982, no one would have imagined what it has grown into today. Walking backwards into history are our Lion Ambassadors. And so I'm excited to introduce a couple of them who are joining us this evening. First, let's start with one of the founders, one of the pioneers from the class of 1983, 
Lori Johnson Vegas. Lori, how are you today? I'm good. How's everything with you? Everything's fantastic. Thank you for joining us. You're in Oklahoma. Uh, yes, I am, Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. This evening. And so we're so grateful that you are on the Football Letter Live with us. Let's also welcome in the Executive Vice President of Lion Ambassadors, Jason Schwartz. Hey, Paul. How's it going? I've, it's going great, Jason. How are you, my friend? Very well, thanks. Are you right here in State College tonight? Indeed, I am. Excellent. I think another uh, someone else joining us from State College is, uh, let's see, Anthony Guzzo. Yeah. He is the S Zone Chair, uh, and he's a general member of the Lion Ambassadors. Anthony, how are you this, this evening? I'm doing great. How are you? I am fantastic. And then a young alumni ambassador and a former Lion Ambassador. I'm, Former Lion Ambassador just doesn't sound right, Connor Pardo, when, when I introduce you. I think it's once a Lion Ambassador, always a Lion Ambassador. Absolutely. Uh, but Connor Pardo is joining us. He's part of the Greater Pittsburgh chapter. He hails from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Connor, how are you this evening? Doing great, Paul. Happy to be here. Happy to be back on with the Lion Ambassadors with the Association. Hey, Connor, let me start with you. How did your experience as a Lion Ambassador enhance your student experience? Paul, my experience as a Lion Ambassador, um, there are very few words to describe it from, you know, giving tours to prospective students to being a part of some of the greatest traditions at Penn State, or kind of to the most important part, in my opinion, um, finding a family at Penn State. That's what I was able to kind of accomplish with Lion Ambassadors. Um, my best friends um, that will be the my friends for the rest of my life um, are in Lion Ambassadors. As you can see there, some stuff from the S Zone. Um, lots of great opportunities came about. It, uh, the ability to professionally develop while also giving back to Penn State University. There's nothing like it. And I can tell you that being a Lion Ambassador was the highlight of my Penn State career. And I look back on it now and as alumni, as an alumnus, and quite often think, gosh, what I would do to be back in those shoes uh, just for one more day, because it truly was, it was something really fantastic and something very, very special to me. And I know to many of my other fellow Lion Ambassadors, and I'm sure all Lion Ambassador alumni um, around the country and around the world. See that, John Black? Look what you did. What a, <laughs> I was, what a great experience Connor happen. was able to have yeah. because of your work. Well, I'm an, I'm an honorary Lion Ambassador, and my daughter was an ambassador too, as well. So it's in the yeah. family. That's great. Also there at the very beginning, Lori Johnson. Lori Johnson, Vegas now. Lori, uh, would you, when you were sitting around that table with, the, with the, your fellow founders, right, could you have ever imagined what it's grown into today? Take us back to those moments when you were forming Lion Ambassadors, and what were those conversations about? Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, I want, I, I want to take a moment because this, we're talking about the student experience. And one of the things that was amazing about that is uh, people don't realize that we have other campuses out there other than University Park and Lion Ambassadors was very tied into uh, the branch campuses. Uh, the way it started, Larry Atwell was actually the advisor for the branch campus student governments. And there were several of us who were branch campus student government presidents that he called upon to come in and help with this situation. In fact, our very first president uh, was a part of a branch campus student government. Uh, so I just think it's so great when we talk about All You Day and we talk about Penn State as a whole for people to know and understand the role that branch campuses played in putting Lion Ambassadors together uh, is amazing. And uh, for those of us who have been around for a while, you might remember the, what we called back in the day, the dungeon of the hub, when that dark area down there in the basement, um, those were, that's where we spent our time. And I will share with you, uh, anyone who's ever been to my garage has seen all of the things that are out there and in a box out there somewhere uh, are some napkins. And on those napkins are notes. Um, I, was, I was the designated person uh, to, I shouldn't say I was designated, we were having these great amazing discussions about what this organization would be, uh, casting vision, um, just, just really putting out there what the mission would be. And we're having all these discussions and I'm thinking, okay, 
none of us are taking notes and this is amazing information. So I just started grabbing napkins from the hub area and just started writing and uh, taking notes on those napkins. And I, I have those to this day. But when you talk about sitting around and thinking about what this organization would look like, we knew what the goal was. We, we did cast those visions. We had an idea, but to sit back and think of the seven of us sitting at that table, uh, just laying it all out, on napkins, you know, paper towels, whatever we could find, and thinking of the role that this organization could play and going to where we are right now. Did I know it was going to be great? 100%. I knew it was going to be amazing. Uh, to this point, I have to say uh, that, yeah, uh, this is beyond our expectations. Uh, and so I'm excited to see all of the changes that it's gone through, all of the positive uh, energy that it's had, the improvements, uh, just everything is, it just makes me very proud to know that I was part of this amazing organization from the very beginning and to watch it grow and to see the honor that it receives always is, is phenomenal. I will share one thing. Uh, when we were talking about, and, and John said this, uh, that, you know, we were kind of the in-between, that we wanted a student organization that could relate to our alumni, could relate to our current students, and then do what we needed to do to help incoming students or potential students. And uh, one of the things that we would do is uh, being out there at football games and, and working with the alumni. And I had this dream because it was, it was amazing, the things that we got to do with the alumni. And I used to think, gosh, these alumni are so rich and they have these amazing tailgates and they stay at the Nittany Lion Inn. And I was like, I can't wait to be an alumni because I wanna do those things. And I just would say one day I will be able to have a tailgate like that, stay at the Nittany Lion Inn and, and just be able to work with students. And I can do that now. And it's just the best feeling ever. And to know that uh, our Lion Ambassadors make that experience what it is. And uh, to know that we have students who are there who just can't wait to become alumni because of what the Lion Ambassadors do is phenomenal. So, hey, Jason, talk a little bit about what Lion Ambassadors do now. What, uh, talk about your, your projects and, and what it's like to be a Lion Ambassador in, in 2020 at Penn State. Sure, Paul. So first of all, it's so cool to hear Lori uh, speak about kind of the founding years of Lion Ambassadors, because one thing I noticed when she was talking is that a lot of the mission and goals of our organization have not faltered at all. You know, it's still about bringing students and alumni together. It's still about embodying our pillars of service, tradition, excellence, and pride. We've just found different ways to do it as, as time progresses as well, which is very cool. So um, in my position as executive vice president, I oversee all of our external programming. So um, extremely visible events like Be Apart From The Start, uh, which John mentioned, uh, which helps incoming freshmen kind of um, assimilate into the university culture. And of course the S Zone, which is our, um, which is our kind of student section experience. Um, you can see one of our S Zones in that picture at Beaver Stadium and before Rec Hall. Um, and then we do a lot of different programs kind of following students um, from the beginning through the end of their Penn State journey. Uh, we like to think we play a role in uh, helping write chapter one of a uh, student's Penn State journey and then keeping them involved with the Alumni Association as they become uh, Penn Staters for life because we like to think that Penn State is a lifelong commitment. So Anthony, let's, uh, let's bring you into the conversation. You know, you're, you're such a positive guy I see you around campus. You're, you're always smiling and, and enthusiastic. And 2020, you get to be the S Zone chair. How how have you how have you handled uh, that role? Knowing like I know that there was all this excitement going into this position for you, and now there there may not be that in stadium experience. Talk a little bit about how you're how you're staying positive through all that. Yeah. So um, you know. I'm, I come from a Penn State family and, you know, um, you were right. My parents were the ones that gave the uh, class of 1982. So yes, hi, mom and dad. Um, but, um, you know, I would watch games with them as a little kid and see the S zone when the television would hand to it. And I'd always go, oh, I want to sit there. That, that's where I want to be. I love Penn State football. And I, um, you know, since coming to Penn State, you know, being a line ambassador has been an awesome experience. And 
over the past couple of years, being able to organize CS Zone uh, for the few games a year as a general member uh, has been a really awesome experience. Uh, I loved last year doing the homecoming game because, you know, I see the S Zone. There's so much Penn State pride there come together with homecoming week as well. And it's kind of an explosion of Penn State pride. I love doing that. Um, I was really excited to be uh, named one of the S Zone chairs this year. And while things are different, I know uh, Jason, myself, and the other S Zone chairs were uh, working hard to think of alternative ways to make an S Zone possible uh, in some way, whether it be things like, you know, getting, if there are no fans allowed, uh, getting a tarp or something with a big S painted on it, putting it over where the S Zone would be, you know, letting the football players know that we may not be there physically, but we're there, our presence is still there, and we're still cheering them on uh, loud and proud. Um, and then also, you know, we do S Zones and other sporting events. So, you know, hopefully in the spring, you know, maybe things are a little bit better with everything going on in the world. And, um, you know, we can have um, fans at other sports and uh, we can do S Zones there. I know in the years past, we've done S Zones for uh, men's basketball, women's basketball, uh, women's volleyball and other sports as well. So, you know, trying to stay positive all the time, trying to stay optimistic and excited to, you know, help out, help athletics out no, no matter how we can. So we should have, we should have, uh, we missed an opportunity with Sandy Barber on here. We should have put her in a corner and said, can we put a banner there in the, in the end zone for the S zone? But uh, yeah. I think we have other ways to get that question in front of her. And I know that they're going to be looking to make sure that there's a great in-stadium experience for our student athletes, right? And so uh, I think that's something that they will be open to. But walk me through the logistics of the S zone. It, it isn't just passing out some t-shirts and, and hoping that you spell it right, right? There's a lot that goes into it, right? There's, there's um, to take us through what putting together an S zone looks like and, and the various different S zones that we do throughout the season. I know you mentioned other sports, but just in Beaver Stadium, there's three or four different configurations of what an S zone might look like. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, First of all, I hope we can spell it right. It's a singular letter. Um, but uh, yes, there is a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, line ambassadors in the past have uh, pretty much diagrammed out the student section at each of our different athletic venues, whether it be Beaver Stadium, the Bryce Jordan Center, Rec Hall. So we know how many um, people need to be standing in each row, what color shirts they need to be wearing. Um, and before the athletic event, we bag all of those shirts, um, put them all in a bag so we can distribute them in an organized fashion at the events themselves. Um, we tell people, stay put where you are, wear your shirt for the whole event, and then it looks great on camera. Um, but yes, we have done a, a lot of different variations. Uh, our typical one is um, a blue S with a white background. We invert that for the whiteout game so it blends in with the, uh, the surrounding uh, kind of picture. Um, we do the black and pink S zone for homecoming to pay homage to uh, Penn State's original colors like Anthony mentioned earlier. And we do a partnership with Thon every single year um, to create the ribbon zone, uh, which uh, a picture of that was shown just a few moments ago. Um, and they put their yellow childhood cancer awareness ribbon right next to our block S. Um, and we we collaborate to, to uh, to uh, pay tribute to the amazing work that they do. So um, we have expanded the kind of uh, designs that we have. We've expanded the athletic venues that we've uh, put this on in, and we uh, are eager to continue to expand, to continue to develop, and to contribute to athletics uh, in any way that we can this season and in future seasons. John Black, yes. uh, you have covered Penn State football uh, for, for such a long time. You have been able to see the stadium expand. You have been able to see the student interaction and the student experience in the stadium change. Talk a little bit about how um, the fan interaction in the game and, and in, in particular, the world's greatest student section has had an impact and has grown over the years uh, at, in Beaver Stadium in your, in your opinion. Well, there's no question. We, we look at this from an alumni perspective, uh, uh, how all alumni love uh, watching Penn State football, but it's uh, the students are the initial uh, group that uh, deserves to be there in the stadium, uh, supporting their uh, classmates and friends uh, on campus. And uh, 
competing in the, the fields of competition, whether it be Beaver Stadium or the uh, other arenas uh, on campus. So it, uh, it's, it's, it's inspiring to look out from the press box and see that block S section. I mean, that, that, that S zone section actually uh, back in the, uh, probably back as far as the late 60s, there was a predecessor to the S zone, which uh, was a block S group that uh, waxed and waned through the years, but they would uh, put up flashcards uh, with different uh, colors to uh, show uh, graphics or spell out words that uh, was something to uh, in, in, uh, increase the student involvement and give the fans a better experience. That uh, ultimately has been uh, uh, followed by the S Zone, which has just been a fantastic uh, group and the Alumni Association has been privileged to uh, sponsor them and, and uh, work with them. Uh, so it's, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're an integral part of a whole student section, 22,000 students, which I think is as many as any major uh, university has in their stadium. Uh, and they incite and they're the catalyst to, for the experience of the entire student section ranked number one in the country. And uh, they just uh, add to the experience in so many ways. They, they were the originators of the uh, whiteout, which is just the epitome of a uh, football Saturday uh, in Beaver State. It's been great for many years. Absolutely. Look, 22,000 students in the student section. It is the largest student section in the country. We get more students at our games than Pitt gets at home football games. And so um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a testament to the dedication of our students. Uh, uh, one final question for our four Lion Ambassadors who are with us this evening. Really quick hitter. I'm going to start with Lori. Lori, what was your Lion Ambassador moment? What is that moment when you think about being an ambassador that sticks out in your mind? Uh, that moment comes when we finally did the interviews and put together the first group of Lion Ambassadors. Uh, and that was the, um, the group of 1982. We actually started the process in 81 of uh, you know, forming the Lion Ambassadors, coming up with all of the ideas. And then once we did went through all of the interviews and put together that first group. Uh, I, I just get like, even looking at the picture, I, I get goosebumps because I just know when we went on our first retreat and we had brainstorming sessions and just talked about what this program was gonna be and the honor to be a part of that first group, that really was, um, that was my highlight. Once we had done it, we knew who the, the brand new ambassadors would be. We knew that this was the first group to ever carry that title that was my finest moment. And, you know, of course there's fun things and, you know, different things that we've done along the way, but by far, once that first group was formed, I just, it, it's almost like um, being a parent when you're just proud of, of your child. And uh, that's kind of how I felt um, when that happened. Excellent. One of, the, one of the, that first group was Joe Batista, who went yes. on from Penn State's, uh, club hockey coach for many years and was instrumental in uh, convincing Terry Pagula to uh, support uh, the uh, building of the Pagula Ice Arena and establish the scholarships for our, our hockey team, both men and women, to become uh, Division I and very competitive in the Big Ten today. So Joe is still in State College and still gets involved in, as an alum in uh, Lion Ambassador activities. Yes, very much so. And again, I just, you know, I think about that first group and, and just the, the, um, the, the passion, the commitment, the loyalty and the dedication that that selection process took and to have uh, those individuals there to just really make a vision, a dream happen. And that's what that group did. They made everything that we did when we sat in the bottom of the hub and we had all of those ideas and, uh, and wanted to to make it and turn it into something, that was the group that started it and made it happen and, and absolutely my finest moment. Anthony, how about you? What's your Lion Ambassador moment so far? Uh, so far, my moment, it's a tour moment. So I was uh, giving a tour to a high school group uh, last fall. And at the end of the tour, uh, the chaperone for them came up to me and had mentioned that 
a few of the students, uh, Penn State was now their top choice after the tour. So it was um, really an awesome moment to know that I, ha I hopefully had some type of impact on um, future Penn Staters. You know, I love Penn State and when I'm giving a tour, I try to pass that love on to all the prospective students. So it was a really cool moment just to see that, you know, I could have, you know, possibly made an impact and, you know, made someone hopefully choose Penn State. That's a story I hear a lot from Lion Ambassadors where a student might recognize them on campus uh, and say, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but I was on your tour and I decided to come to Penn State because of you. Uh, never doubt that you're making an impact, Anthony, and uh, giving tours through Lion Ambassadors is just one of the ways that you're making a difference here at Penn State. Jason, what was your moment? I think my moment would have to be um, helping plan be a part from the start uh, last summer. Uh, it was just a great experience overall, getting some project planning experience, but uh, it also gave me the opportunity to make an impact on the beginning of these people's Penn State stories. Um, to get 6,000 people into Rec Hall, um, remember that when we used to be able I to do, do that? Do. Um, getting 6,000 people into Rec Hall just to uh, experience um, the beginning of their Penn State journey together kind of be introduced to all the things they get, can get involved in is just a really special thing. And my brother was actually a part of that first year class. So getting to welcome him in, in that fashion was, um, I, I was just so grateful for it. Excellent. Connor Pardo, uh, a guy who had many moments uh, during his time at Penn State involved in so many different things. But if you had to pick one, what is your Lion Ambassador moment? Well, wow, Paul, that, like you said, that's a really tough question. Um, you know what? I'm going to do two really quick moments. The first moment in Lion Ambassadors, something special that we do is we get um, buddies. And buddies are kind of similar to Greek life, littles or bigs. Right. And I was so lucky to have a great older buddy, an awesome younger buddy, and then a younger G buddy, um, as, as you would call it. So I, that was one of my favorite moments, getting my little buddy. Uh, was truly one of the most uh, exciting times for me because I was able to find a friend uh, that I'll have for the rest of my life and kind of seeing that lineage play out with, with my G buddy. Uh, it's really awesome. And then I'd say my other moment actually has to do with my role that I was. I was the administrative vice president uh, my senior year, so last, last year. And one of the many duties of the administrative vice president is to educate, welcome, and kind of mentor the first, the next, the new class of Lion Ambassadors. So I'm really happy and, and lucky to say that I had 58 kiddos last spring, as I like to call them. Um, and they, they blew me away by their interest, their knowledge, and just their eagerness to become wonderful representatives of Penn State University, representing Penn State to the highest, uh, highest extent, but also Lion Ambassadors. Uh, they're gonna, they're leaving their legacy currently living through this. And every time I see anything on social media about my kiddos, about those uh, 58 class of 2020 Lion Ambassadors, I just, I can, I can only smile and be so happy for them. And another really special thing, my brother is a part of that class. So being able to see him uh, flourish as a Lion Ambassador along with the rest of them, it's truly something special and really, really a significant moment to me as a Lion Ambassador at Penn State. Well, amazing. I hope you all could stick around for just a couple more minutes as we bring our next guest in. You guys were walking back in, walking backwards into history. Uh, the next guest uh, also has really strong connections to Lion Ambassadors. Let's welcome John Neese from the class of 83 to the program. John, how are you? Doing great, Paul. Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Hey, John. John, great to have you with us. So John married into the Lion Ambassador family, and he's also the father of a Lion Ambassador. You guys may have crossed paths with Kate Neese, uh, but John, welcome, welcome to the program. Hey, it's great to be here, Paul. Anything Penn State. John is a teaching professor. He's the associate head of undergraduate programs in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science. And John, you are kind of the go-to person to talk about weather uh, on game day. I know um, alumni and fans, they'll either reach out to you through social media, they'll, they'll call you, they'll ask you about an inside scoop on the weather forecast, only for, only for the apparel that they should be wearing to the game, for, for no other reasons um, than that. But uh, 
talk a little bit about uh, how you have become kind of the, the go-to guy for, for weather forecasting for Penn State football. Well, actually, I mean, I miss not thinking about the game day forecast. It has become sort of a weekly tradition. Um, I actually, uh, when Bill O'Brien was here, uh, one night on the, uh, on the football show, he mentioned that a member of his staff was uh, his weather go-to guy. And I said, well, the Penn State Department of Meteorology should be your weather go-to guy. So I, I got in touch with him. And since that day, I've actually supplied weather forecasts uh, through various means to the team. And that's been a real source of pride and a source of enjoyment to me to know that we can, we can help the team. I'm absolutely convinced that one of these days, the team that has the most weather knowledge is going to win the game. And that'll end up making the difference. It's going to happen. Trust me on that. <laughs> but anyway, I do miss uh, being involved in thinking about uh, game day. I mean, as soon as one game is over, you think about the next week. So I'm kind of looking forward to October 24th to begin thinking about that again. Absolutely. John, uh, the meteorology program is a point of pride at Penn State. We talk about um, X number of meteorologists. It's, I think it's one out of any, every four meteorologists in the world is a Penn Stater, uh, but talk a little bit about uh, the College of EMS at Penn State and, and how it produces so many talented graduates. Well, I don't want to throw any cold water on that statistic. Uh, when I first met James Franklin, he said that and uh, it made me smile. I don't think it's one out of four anymore, but we'll go with it, okay? John, um, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, but the truth is, that it's, it is really all about the people. I mean, we have great alums. I do know for a fact that about 150 alumni of our department are currently doing television somewhere in the United States, right. television meteorology. So what great ambassadors to come back to the, you know, the line ambassadors, what great, very public ambassadors out there for our department. And uh, you multiply that by 10 or more in terms of folks in the field, because it's really not just about television, but it's about our alums, it's about our faculty, very strong reputation, great researchers, great teachers. And then, you know this, we get the best students. I mean, our reputation attracts students from all over the country. We have students, this semester I'm teaching kids from California, kids from South Carolina, students from Connecticut, and, and, and all the great students that we get from Pennsylvania. So it's really, it's really about the people. And then we have a great facility over there on the sixth floor of the Walker Building. Thanks. Now, John, for, for the longest time, and I'm, I hope Sandy's not listening, but for the longest time, we have heard there's no way you could play hockey in Beaver Stadium in, in the winter because Beaver Stadium isn't prepared for winter football. But now we're expecting potentially to play football in December in Beaver Stadium. And so talk a little bit about the kind of weather we can expect in December, December 12th in particular, uh, and um, and if Beaver Stadium uh, is prepared to handle that kind of that kind of environment, well, here's how I like to think about it. We played a game in Beaver Stadium last year on November 30th. Right. So basically, that time of the year, the the averages are dropping at the rate of about two or three degrees per week. So if you go three weeks into December, the numbers will come down between six and nine degrees. So if you can put up with November 30th, subtract a few degrees from that on average, you can put up with December 12th. I mean, that's how I look at it. Of course, the, the field, uh, those are just averages. You never know. We can get some quirky days in December where the weather's just fine. We can also get quirky days in December where you get a foot of snow. So that's what we're going to be up against. But really, if you could have put up, you know, I put up with that Rutgers game last year on November 30th. So at, subtract six degrees from that, more or less on average, and that's what you'll get. Uh, that is, of course, assuming you're playing at the warmest time of the day, and who knows what the kickoff times will be, but I assume they'll be either noon or, or 3.30. So, John, you're a guy who is, uh, is a Penn State football fan. You're a sports fan. How much does the weather actually have an impact on performance on the field? If I... If I think about, you know, oftentimes they'll say, well, I remember back in the 90s, Miami came up to Beaver Stadium a couple of times and we thought, 
maybe we'd have a little bit of an advantage because they're coming from the heat of Miami up to the cooler weather weather of um, of, of Happy Valley. Now, I don't think they ever came in November. I think those games were, mm. were all in September. But yeah. how much impact does it have on warm weather teams going to cold weather envi environments or vice versa? Well, there's some work that's been done on that in the NFL, but I've never seen anything, and I've not done, run the numbers personally myself. So the short answer, and I, and I think you have to be uh, able to say this every once in a while, is I don't know. <laughs> but what I do know is that if you have knowledge of the wind patterns in inside a football stadium and you know what happens in Beaver Stadium when the wind is blowing from the northwest and you're pretty confident that's the way it's going to be blown in the second half, that can be a real advantage for a home team. So I'm a big believer in, in the, the idea of wind. And also, uh, you know as well as I do, there are games when it rains in the first half and then doesn't rain in the second half or vice versa or the rain changes to snow, or that bizarre game that was played in, in Rutgers that one year when the rain changed to sleet in the right. fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. If you have a little bit of inside knowledge about that, to me, that overrides any advantage or disadvantage that may come with temperature. So I like to focus on the wind and the timing of the precipitation, because during any three-hour game, three-and-a-half-hour game, those elements can change, and they can change significantly. In fact, you know, I'm, the one thing I'm looking forward to if we're playing football in December, there are going to be a couple memorable Big Ten weather games right. this year in December. I think you can bank on that. Absolutely. You know, I, the Beaver Stadium question, certainly a lot of things can go on on the field in Beaver Stadium, right? I think the, I think the analysis has been done uh, when there's people in the stadium, and we're not going to really have to deal with that this year, right, with 100,000 100,000 people in the stadium. Right. John Black, in your time watching Penn State football, you've probably seen just about everything weather-wise. Any big weather games that, that stick out in your mind, John? Oh, surely. The first time that we had uh, Michigan come, come to Beaver Stadium uh, after we had just joined the Big Ten, uh, we had a huge snowstorm on Thursday before the game on Saturday. And we had volunteers. We had prisoners from Rockview. Uh, we had anybody we could get into that stadium all day Friday shoveling the snow out and packing it even underneath the, uh, the benches. Uh, we had the fans on game day trudging across all of these fields around the stadium that are normally uh, occupied by 26,000 automobiles. Right. But that day they were the fields were full of snow and the fans had to get as close as they could by bus or being dropped off uh, by friends and then trudge through the snow across those parking lots to uh, be witnesses to the game that took place. And 80,000 of them showed up and we won the ball game and that's uh, what really counted. But I affectionately, affectionately known as the Snow Bowl, John. I remember that game. That was my wife's first Penn State football game. I think it was sealed with Joe Nastasi on a fake field goal there at the end to seal the victory over the Michigan Wolverines that exactly. day. Exactly, exactly it was. And uh, Paul, I don't think we can let John uh, get away here without pointing out that he has all three of his degrees from Penn State, so he's a diehard right from the get-go. And uh, his wife, Gwen, was one of our very first advisors to the Lion Ambassadors back in the, the early days. And she was a great one, too. She still that is. is. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, that is great. Well, look, we are just about out of time. And I want to thank you all for joining us. A lot of great memories being shared in the chat box there. Roger Williams remembering sitting in the rain against Notre Dame. Uh, that could be a couple games. If I recall, I remember the 85 game was in the rain. I remember a 21-20 victory over Notre Dame in the snow. Um, yeah, a lot of bad weather games at Notre Dame, and in mud uh, but a lot of great memories being shared there. We had a mud bowl against uh, Notre Dame in a night game here, and uh, we uh, had a, a full game downpour against Navy back in about 1971. Yeah. And uh, – Yes, there have been a lot of uh, a lot of memorable uh, weather Absolutely. related games. So, John, uh, what can we expect in next week's football letter? 
Well, next week uh, we're going to try to give you uh, the uh, our watchers here a little bit of back scenes uh, information about uh, how the football editor is put together. Uh, we're going to feature our photo outstanding photographer, Steve Manuel, who comes up with all those fantastic game day photos yeah, that you can blow up full color, full screen on your computer uh, each Monday morning. And uh, we'll have a little bit about the football letter blog, uh, John Petitionock and Vince Lugano, who uh, contribute to that uh, uh, adjunct to the football letter, which is a lot of great stories in there that uh, our readers don't want to miss. So uh, that's one of the, our features next week. That is wonderful. Thank you, John. And thank you to all of you for joining us here on Football Letter Live. The work that you continue to do, whether it's our current students, Jason and Anthony, or our alumni, Lori, Connor, and John, continue to swell thy fame of dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. And to those of you tuning in on Facebook Live and here in the Zoom room, thank you so much for joining us. To those members out there, thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. We are powered by pride and your support fuels that pride. If you're not a member of the Alumni Association, what are you waiting for? Go online today at alumni.psu.edu slash join and become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Uh, we are wrapping up this evening, uh, but we can keep the conversation going on social media. Visit us on Facebook and let us know your top spot to visit at University Park when you come for a football game. Uh, you could all, do you visit the Lion Shrine? Do you make a stop at the Berkey Creamery? Do you hike Mount Nittany? Use the hashtag FBL Live. That's hashtag FBL Live on Facebook or on the other social media platforms and share your must stops here on game day weekend in Happy Valley. Join us next week as we welcome the Football Letter Live photographer, Steve Manuel. He is a character you do not want to miss out on that program not at all. Um, also scheduled <laughs> next week yeah we're gonna have to we might have we might need a tape delay for steve right uh, <laughs> next uh tune into our other programs next week tuesday we'll be with dr ray hole he is the director of the penn state cancer institute he's going to lead a discussion titled psu and the big 10 leveling the playing field for cancer care and treatment Next Wednesday, we, it's coffee hour. I'll be joined by John Culinary. John is a television personality, designer and builder and developer. You might know him from HGTV's Kitchen Cousins. Uh, so join us Wednesday at nine o'clock in the morning for that. If you're interested in any of our other virtual programming, you can find that all on our website at alumni.psu.edu. Thank you once again for joining us and for all you do for the university for the glory and for the future. We are Penn State. Penn State. Penn State.